Finally, I would like to compute the arbitrage free price of barrier options. And you see there's a difference between barrier options and your opinion call or put options, for instance. Namely, the barrier option will depend on the whole trajectory of the underlying price process, whereas the European call or put option only depends on the terminal value of our price process. And for that reason, I would like to impose the following additional conditions on our arbitrage-free cox ross rubinstein model, which I will denote by S bar and which is defined on our favorite filtered probability space omega f f t p. Namely, I would like to assume that a probability measure p um, has the following property, namely that the random variables u1 up to u capital T, which we assumed to be iid under p, I have now um, the additional property that the probability of the event that u1 is equal to plus 1 is equal to the probability that u1 is equal to minus 1, which should be equal to 1 half. And the second condition I would like to impose is that uh, the product of 1 plus d times 1 plus u is equal to 1. So here's a remark. So the second condition, um, together with the fact that the parameter d is strictly in between minus 1 and d, uh, u, implies that the value d is strictly less than 0, whereas the value u is strictly larger than 0. Meaning that in that particular a cox ross rubinstein model, we really have that the price process at time t plus 1 is obtained from the price process at uh, time point t, either by jumping upward or by jumping downward. And um, a second reason why we introduced uh, this particular choice on the probability measure p and on this um, parameters u and d is the following. I can rewrite the price process of the risky security at time point little t in the following way. By definition, that's nothing else but the product of the initial value s one naught times the product n from 1 up to t of these factors 1 plus rn, where rn denotes the return. And now let me do the following. So in that product you see only these two factors appear, the factor 1 plus u and the factor 1 plus d. And how often do you see the factor 1 plus u appearing? Well, you see it the number of times the random variable rn is equal to u. So that's nothing else but the sum n from 1 to t of the indicator function that rn is equal to u. Likewise, you see the factor 1 plus d occurring um, the following number of times, namely the sum one, uh, n equal to 1 up to t of the indicator function that rn is equal to d. But by that assumption over here, I can express the value 1 plus d in terms of the value 1 over 1 plus u, which allows me to rewrite everything in terms of 1 plus u, and in doing so I get here that minus sign, meaning I get simply uh, the factor 1 plus u to the power sum n from 1 to t of the indicator function that rn is equal to u minus the indicator function that rn is equal to d. And remember that the event that rn is equal to u is the same as the event that un is equal to plus 1, whereas the event that rn is equal to d is the same as the event that RN, uh, un is equal to minus 1. And due to that particular form of these indicator functions, you immediately see that you can rewrite that difference simply as the value un. Meaning you end up with the following expression for the price process at time point t. It's the initial value times the factor 1 plus u to the power sum n from 1 up to t of un. And in order to uh, lighten a little bit the notation, let me introduce for that 
sum over here the following process, which I called call zt. So z0 should be equal to zero, and zt is simply that sum n from one up to t of u n, and this is true for all little t in this index set one up to capital T. And you see by as by our assumption one uh, that this process ZT is nothing else but a simple symmetric random walk on the integer lattice, meaning the expected value of that random walker at every time point is equal to zero. And we have seen that uh, this process is in particular a martingale under P. So this we have uh, convinced ourselves in example 1.16. Hence, we end up with the following. We have that the price process of our risky security at time 1t is given in terms of the initial value times this factor 1 plus u to the power, the value of a simple symmetric random walk at time point t. So in that particular form uh, is also sometimes called a geometric random walk. So and why we are so interested in that particular situation? Well, um, I claim that we can compute the distribution of zt for any t explicitly. Namely, for instance, the probability that z capital T is equal to k is given by uh, this factor 2 to the minus t times this binomial um, uh, coefficient and um, t choose t plus k over 2 and that um, binomial um, factor over here is non-zero if and only if t plus k over 2 is takes values in the natural number including zero and so the modulus of k is less than or equal to capital T. So why is that true? Well, you see the event that the random walker at time point capital T takes the value little k, k means nothing else but that the number of down steps, so meaning the number of time points n such that un is equal to minus one, plus this uh, parameter k should be equal to the number of up steps. And since the number of down steps plus the number of up steps is equal to capital T, you see you can immediately rewrite um, the number of up steps, uh, down steps in terms of t minus the number of up steps. And then you can simply solve that equation for the number of up steps and you simply get uh, that expression in terms of capital T and K. And now it's rather clear, once you know the number of up steps explicitly, you know how many possibilities you have um, uh, to choose out of T steps exactly that number of up steps that's namely given by that binomial coefficient. Hence, we have uh, seen where this term comes from. Moreover, by definition of that, or by the property of that probability measure uh, p, namely that the random variables u1 up to ut uh, are um, uh, Bernoulli random variables with um, success probability one half, you see that this gives rise to that factor two to the minus t. And moreover, you see that this binomial uh, factor is only non-zero if the, um, the term capital T plus K over 2 takes values in the set 0, 1 up to capital T. And that concludes that simple lemma. And this lemma we will use now to prove one important result, namely the so-called reflection principle for simple symmetric random walks. So I consider simple symmetric random walk ZT defined on our um, integer letter Z and I would like to denote by Z capital T star the maximum of all T in this index head I of our random walker ZT. And then 
by fixing two parameters, namely a number k from the natural numbers and a parameter l chosen from the natural numbers including zero, I am interested in the p-probability of the event that the maximum of the random walker up to time capital T exceeds the level um, k, whereas its terminal value at time point capital T is at a position k minus l. And then it turns out that that complicates, the probability of that complicated event is equal to the probability of the event that the random walker at time point capital T is equal to k plus r. And we have seen that uh, probability we can compute explicitly. And the second statement is the following, that we can also compute the probability of the event that the maximum is exactly at height k given or uh, intersecting with the event that the random walker at time point capital T is at position k minus well. And this is given by that prefactor uh, 2 times k plus r plus 1 divided by capital T plus 1 times the probability that the random walker now at time point capital T plus 1 is equal to um, or is at position k plus l plus 1. So let me first explain to you the proof of part A. And uh, in order to get an idea about the strategy, let us have a look at the following picture. So in blue, I sketched one possible realization of a trajectory of our random walker up to time capital T. So you see the simple random walker only goes one step up or one step down at every time point. And um, here by the screen line I indicated the level k which we would like to exceed. So and that trajectory does that job. It exceeds this level k and it ends up at a position which is less than or equal to that level k, namely this position k minus l. So and then you should observe the following, namely that each trajectory of length t has the same probability. That's important. And the second fact is uh, that there's a bijection or that it's possible to con construct a bijection between two different kind of paths. And for that, I would like to introduce that time point tau, where the random walker um, first reaches the level k. So that's here where it first reaches the level, this height k. And then I do the following. Whenever this original trajectory goes down, I consider a kind of mirrored trajectory, so mirrored at that uh, level k and um, where it instead going, of going down it goes up and whenever the original trajectory goes up this mirrored path goes down and by doing so I see I get a trajectory which then ends up at a position k plus l which is above this barrier k. So now let Let's turn back to mathematics and make a proof out of that. So in order to do so, I would like to introduce first the set of all nearest neighbor paths of Lex T, which starts at time point zero and zero. So that's nothing else but all these uh, vectors Z taken from the integer uh, um, numbers to the power capital T plus one, such that Z naught is equal to zero and the increments zt minus zt minus one the modulus of that is equal to one meaning this trajectory is only allowed to change by plus or minus one so and then i define for any nearest neighbor path that function tau which takes values then in the set zero up to capital t union infinity in the following way so uh, tor of a nearest neighbor path v is nothing else but the infimum over all 
um, uh, time points little t in our index set such that zt is larger or equal to k. And again, I choose the convention that if I take the infimum of a, the empty set, then it's equal to infinity. So now let us introduce the following um, mapping from the set of all nearest neighbor trajectories um, of lengths t starting from zero onto itself. So that's this map phi. And the map phi does the following. It takes the nearest neighbor path of length capital T, which starts in zero, and it does the following. So the first tor plus one um, components of that path, it, this map leaves completely unchanged. And from time point tor plus one on, it does the following. So you see the trajectory at time point uh, z tor plus one, you can artificially write as z tor plus z tor plus one minus z tor. And now you simply change the sign of the increment. So that's the increment, and I change here the sign from plus to minus, meaning I flipped from a downward step to an upward step or from an upward step to a downward step. And this I do for every increment from tor on. So and, and by using some cancellation and this kind of telescopic sum, I end up with the formula that every time point which is larger than tor can be written in the following form, z tor minus z t minus z tor, where t should be larger than tor, and in particular it holds true for capital T. And you clearly see that this map is a bijection from the set of all nearest neighbor uh, paths of length t starting from zero. Moreover, I would like to introduce now the following set, namely the set AKL, which is nothing else but all the nearest neighbor trajectories of length t, which have the property that the maximum along the trajectory exceeds the level k, and the terminal value of that trajectory is at position k minus l. So when you see that set is the same as the set of all nearest neighbor trajectories, such that this function tor of z is less than or equal to tor, uh, intersecting with the event that um, um, z, so this trajectory at time point capital T is at position k minus l. So why is that true? Well, you see, in order um, that the random walker exceeds the level k, you see in that time point, it means we have here uh, a value tor which is strictly less than or equal to capital tor. So that's why we have the, the equality between these two sets. And you also see in the situation when the infimum uh, of the empty set occur, meaning we don't hit that level. So you see in that particular situation, you, you have here simply defined an identity, but we are not interested in that situation. So, and here's a second observation. Now let us consider the image of the set AKL under this um, map phi. And you clearly see that it's nothing else but the set of all nearest neighbor trajectories of length t starting from zero, such that uh, this trajectory ends up at time point capital T at position k plus l. So now let us come back to our simple random walker. So we are interested in the p probability of the event that the maximum of the random walker up to time capital T exceeds the level k and the terminal value of this random walker is at a position k minus l. So this I can first of all rewrite by using the uh, additivity of the probability measure in the following form. So that's the sum of all trajectories z taken from the set AKL um, of the probability that the random walker is equal to this particular chosen trajectory. And you see all these events are disjoint. That's why I'm allowed to uh, use uh, the additivity to bring the union um, out as a sum. 
But since all these probabilities for every trajectory is the same, namely the value 2 to the minus capital T, uh, I only have to think about or ask how many trajectories are in that set of trajectory which exceeds the level uh, k and end up as position k minus l. So that's exactly uh, the scalarity of the set AKL. But since I have a uh, one-to-one correspondence um, between the set AKL and the set phi of AKL, so I don't change the number of trajectories. And then I can undo what I have done here. I can write the cardinality of phi of AKL simply um, as the sum of all the in the set phi of AKL times the probability that the random walker uh, takes exactly that particular chosen trajectory. But again, using additivity of the probability measure, that's nothing else but the event that uh, the random walker at time capital T is at position K plus L. And that uh, finishes the uh, proof of part A. Now let us have a look at the proof of part uh, B of that lemma. And that's uh, a direct consequence of the part A. Why is that the case? Well, I can rewrite the probability of the event that the maximum of the random walker up to time capital T is equal uh, to K, intersecting with the event that the random walker at time one capital T is at position K minus L, in terms of the probability of the event that the random walker or the maximum of the random walker exceeds the level k and it's at position k minus l at time point capital T minus the probability of the event that the random walker and um, that the maximum of the random walker exceeds the level k plus one, given that it's at time point capital T at position k minus l. And now I simply write this k minus l in a more complicated form, namely as k plus 1 minus l plus 1. But then I can apply the result of part A, which allows me to rewrite that complicated uh, event or the probability of that complicated event in terms of the probability of the event that the random walker at time point capital T is at position k plus l minus the probability that the random walker at time point capital T is at position k plus 1 plus l plus 1. So now I would like to analyze that difference in more detail. So in on order to simplify a little bit the notation, let me introduce the following abbreviation I denote by j, the following uh, expression, that's 1 half capital T plus k plus l. So this difference of these um, two probabilities I am interested in can be written by the lemma 3.5 in terms of the following expression. Namely, it's nothing else but 2 to the minus t of this binomial coefficient capital T choose j, and here j comes into the picture, minus 2 to the minus t times this binomial coefficient, capital T, choose um, j plus 1. And you see, either both of these binomial factors, uh, these both expressions are uh, non-zero or both expressions are zero. Why is that the case? You see, if that condition here is satisfied, then it's also satisfied if I added plus 1 here. So if I know that that value is a natural number including zero, then I can add plus 1, and then I have still a natural number, provided that I'm not exceeding that uh, um, value over here, but that's also not a big problem, because then the equality also holds true. Um, but nevertheless, let's simply write down these two binomial coefficients explicitly, and uh, including the situation that um, it might be zero, and this is occurring in case that uh, j is larger or equal to t, 
because in that particular situation you also um, see this term uh, t minus t appearing and then by definition of this binomial factors all these terms are zero so we don't have to distinguish more cases in that particular situation and what i have done here is the following so this binomial coefficient coefficient is nothing else but t factorial divided by j factorial times um, t minus j factorial uh, so in the um, denominator uh, and now I multiplied the numerator by the term t plus 1 and di divided by t plus 1 and in doing so I get this term t plus 1 factorial and the same I do for this uh, factor j factorial and multiply it by j plus 1 to get a j plus 1 factorial and I have to divide by j plus 1 which gets out here by that factor. And the same I do here in that second binomial coefficient, namely it's nothing else but and um, again I rewrite this t factorial in terms of t plus 1 factorial by dividing by t plus 1 and I rewrite this um, factorial t minus j plus 1 in bracket as t minus j factorial and then I have to compensate that by that factor t minus j. Why I have done that? Well, now I can take out these two binomial coefficients. So I get in that way the term 2 to the minus t times t plus 1 choose j plus 1. And what is left is simply the difference of these two ratios, which is clearly given as the ratio 2 minus j, uh, uh, 2 times j minus capital T plus 1 divided by capital T plus 1. And now I can simply rewrite that binomial coefficient and with that uh, prefactor over here in terms of the probability that the random walker at time point capital T plus 1 is at the position k plus l plus 1. So why is that true? Well, let us have a look what j plus 1 um, um, what kind of value it has. So by plugging in the definition of j, you see it's nothing else but k uh, t plus k plus l plus 2 divided by um, 2. And this t plus k plus l plus 2, you can also write artificially as t plus 1 plus k plus l plus 1. And now going back to that uh, expression over here, we see K, t plus k gives then that probability that the random walker at time point capital T is at position k and that's why we get here that um, position k plus l plus 1. And that uh, prefactor over here you simply get by plugging in the value for j because then this one half cancels out, the t cancels out and you're left with k plus l plus 1. And that's concludes the proof of um, that lemma. So the next lemma I would like to um, discuss what kind of consequences it has for a reflection principle under that measure Q, when you choose Q from the set of all equivalent Martingale measures, which we know under the assumption that our underlying cox ross rubinstein model is arbitrage-free, that it's unique. So, and the first statement is the following. I can specify explicitly the random Nicodemus derivative between the equivalent Martingale measure and our underlying physical measure. Namely, it's nothing else but this uh, factor 2 to the uh, power capital T times Q to the capital T plus ZT over 2 times 1 plus Q um, sorry, as a typo, it's 1 minus q to the power uh, um, capital T minus zt over 2. So, and here q is this parameter r minus d over u minus d, and we know under the condition that uh, the underlying cox ross rubinstein model is arbitrage-free, that parameter takes values in the open interval 0, 1. 
So that's the first part of that um, lemma. And the second part stays now the following, namely the reflection principle under this equivalent Martin Q, namely the Q probability of the events at the random walker exceeds the level k, so the maximum exceeds the level k, and the random walker at time point capital T is at position k minus l, is given uh, in terms of 1 minus q over q to the power l times the q probability that z capital T is equal to k plus l, or that's the same as the ratio q divided by q minus 1 to the power k times the probability that the random walker at time point capital T is at position minus k plus l. So let us first address um, the, the statement about the radon nicodem derivative. So for that I would like to introduce that function phi on z, which is nothing else but uh, q half times the indicator function z is equal to u plus 1 minus q half times the indicator function z z is equal to z. So why is that the case? Well, this we have already seen in the proof of theorem 3.1. And there we also have seen that the stratum Nicodem derivative is nothing else but this product n from 1 up to capital T of that function phi of rn. So now let us explicitly write down what phi of rn is. So I take out this factor 1 half, so this gives me then this factor 2 to the minus t, and then I end up with this product n from 1 up to capital T of um, the, the sum q times the indicator function that rn is equal to u plus 1 minus q times the indicator function that r n is equal to d, and now I can rewrite that event that r n is equal to u and r n is equal to d in terms of the event that u n is equal to plus 1 or u n is equal to minus 1. And since only one of these two events can occur, that's nothing else but um, this factor q occurs um, um, as the sum n from 1 to capital T indicator function u n equal to plus 1 times and likewise the factor 1 minus q occurs sum n from 1 to capital T indicator function that u n is equal to minus 1 times. So now I simply uh, would like to rewrite the, the number of up uh, steps and the number of down steps of our random walker in terms of the position of the random walker at the terminal time point and the, the length of our uh, time horizon. So and this I can do in the following way. So first of all I know that the number of up steps plus the number of down steps is equal to capital T. And on the other hand, I know that the number of up steps minus the number of down steps is equal to the value of, of the random walker at time point capital T. And now you see by taking um, differences, you end up immediately by the expression that the number of up steps is given by t plus zt over 2. So the 2 comes from that term, the term cancels out, and by taking differences between these two, you see that the number of down steps is given by capital T minus ct over 2. And that then completes the proof of part A. So in the proof of part B is also rather straightforward. So you fix two parameters k from the natural numbers and l from the natural numbers including 0. And then you start with the Q probability of the event that the maximum of the random walker exceeds the level K and is at the terminal value in capital T at position K minus L. First of all, in terms of the P probability of that event. And in order to do so, you simply use the radon nicodem derivative. Namely, you know that this Q probability is nothing else but this p 
p probability of that complicated event times this uh, prefactor 2 to the minus t. So this we have just seen from here. And then you have q times capital T plus uh, zt over 2. But since we know that zt is equal to um, k minus l, we simply get here the expression capital T plus k minus l over 2. And likewise we get um, the expression 1 minus q to the power capital T minus uh, k minus l in bracket, which is nothing else, capital T minus k plus l over 2. So and then I can use the reflection principle in, uh, to rewrite that probability over here in terms of the pre-probability of the event that zt is equal to k plus l. So and moreover I know that the probability of the event that zt is equal to k plus l is the same as the, the probability uh, under p of the event that z capital T is equal to minus k plus l. And this has something uh, only something to do that our distribution of zt under p is symmetric. And that's why the, this probability of the event that we end up at position k plus l is the same as the probability of the event that we end up at position minus k plus l. So and what you do then is, uh, well, you simply rewrite the probability of that event or the probability of the event with minus k plus l in terms of q. And in order to do so, let's discuss that for that event over here. So we have to get here a plus l. So meaning I have to add a l and I have to subtract another l, which gives me this factor q to the minus l. And I have to do the same here. I have to subtract here an l and add an l. I get here this uh, factor 1 minus q to the l, and that's exactly that prefactor over here. And the other terms are compensated or put together with this probability to get that q probability of the event that the random walker at time point capital T is at position k plus l. And this then concludes the proof. Okay, so these are all the tools we need in order to, to compute the arbitrage free prices of a barrier option. And here I choose, for example, an up and in call option. So I consider an arbitrage free Cox Ross Rubinstein model with the particular assumption on the measure p and the behavior of the factor 1 plus u and times uh, 1 plus d is equal to 1. And I consider that up and in call option where there's nothing else but the following. So it looks like a European in call option, but then I multiply it with the indicator function that the maximum of the price process should exceed the value b, so our barrier, in order such that um, uh, option becomes effective. So and here t is again the maturity, k strictly larger than zero is the strike price, and b strictly larger than the maximum between the initial value of our price process and this um, strike price k. Yeah, because without that assumption, uh, we clearly see um, that uh, then this process um, is a little bit trivial because whenever um, the barrier B is below the value K, you see this condition is automatically satisfied when that condition uh, gives you a non-zero payoff. And if it's less than and the starting value, then you can completely drop that condition. So in order to compute the price, so the arbitrage free price of that uh, particular European contingent claim, let me assume with a, with a loss, without loss of generality that this barrier B has the following explicit form, namely it's S, um, so the initial price of our price process um, 
times the factor 1 plus u to the power k for some k in the natural numbers. So and you see, in general, that k might not be a natural number, but then you take the um, corresponding integer part without changing the computation, but you're making the notation a little bit more heavier. That's why I would like to consider only this kind of barrier in the sequel. So and then the price, so the arbitrage free price of our uh, up and in call option is nothing else but the discounted price of our up and in call option. Why? Because S00 is equal to 1. And we know by theorem 2.19 that this arbitrage free price is nothing else but the expected value under our equivalent Martingale measure, which in this particular situation is unique, of this discounted contingent claim. So since this value S not capital T is deterministic and given by 1 plus R to the T, you get that factor 1 plus R to the minus T out. And we are only interested in computing the expected value under Q of our up uh, and in call option. And now I would like to do the following. I would like to um, uh, write a complicated one, namely I write the one that is the indicator function that S1 T is larger equal to B plus the indicator function of S1 T is strictly less than B. And now you see if I do so, this maximum over here is clearly, so this event that the maximum of Si uh, t is larger or equal to b is clearly contained in that event that Si capital T is larger or equal to b. So when we know that, then we also know that the maximum has exceeded that level. So here I end up with a much more simpler um, option, namely that option we have written here. So this uh, European contingent claim we have here only depends on the value of our underlying price process at maturity. And this we can easily compute. So now then let us have a look at that more complicated expected value here. So we would like to compute the expected value under Q of the positive part of the difference between the price process at maturity minus the strike price times the indicator function that the maximum exceeds the barrier uh, times the indicator function that the terminal value uh, of the price process is below the barrier. So let me recall that we can rewrite the price process S1t as its initial value times the factor 1 plus u to the power zt, where zt was our simple symmetric random walk under this measure p. In particular, we know that this random walker z capital T takes only values in the set minus t, minus t plus 2, and so on until capital T minus 2 until capital T. Why? Well, you see, when you change one of the random variable un used in the definition of zt from let's say minus one to plus one, you change the value of zt exactly by a value two. Okay, so let us now focus on that um, expected value and by this previous lemma, I can now do the following. So I start with that expected value I first rewrite that uh, price process in terms of the random walker and this I can also do here. And you see the maximum um, of 1 plus u to the power zt, you can also write as 1 plus u to the maximum of zt because u is positive. So here I use that explicitly. And then you see this term 1 plus u to the maximum larger equal to s1 naught 1 plus u to some k. You can take the logarithm on both sides. You cancel out s1 naught and you cancel out uh, the term logarithm of 1 plus u. And you end up 
with the indicator function that the random walker up to time capital T should exceed the level K and likewise you obtain that random walker at uh, time point capital T should be at position um, uh, it should be below this value and uh, strictly below this value K and now I simply write down where it could be namely it could be at a position L from 1 up to capital T minus K and then I, this random walker might be at position K minus L. So by but by fixing that value you see I can replace here that ZT by the value K minus L then this term becomes completely deterministic I can take it out from the expected value and then I end up with the Q probability of the event that the maximum up to kind of capital T exceeds the value K and the terminal value of the random walker is at position K minus L. But this we just have computed in the previous lemma, namely in lemma 3.7b. And we see that's equal to that prefactor Q divided by Q minus 1 to the power K times the Q probability of the event that the random walker at time point capital T is at position minus K plus L. So what I would like to do now is I would like to undo that step which we have done here. So for that purpose I would like to write the difference K minus well L as, as, the, as the exponent minus K plus L uh, and for that I have to um, add in the exponent the, the term uh, 2k and have to subtract that. So I get here the additional factor u uh, 1 plus u to the power 2k, which is nothing else but the height of the barrier divided by s1 naught squared. So and once I have done that, then I can write that probability as the expected value under Q of the indicator function. I can bring that, that term over here inside the expected value and then I can replace this exponent minus K plus L by this random variable ZT. And in doing so I simply obtain the following expression, namely this uh, factor Q divided by 1 minus Q to the K times the expected value under Q of the difference between S1 naught um, times 1 plus U to the ZT times this factor and um, B divided by S1 naught squared minus K and I take the positive part of that times the indicator function that ZT is um, less than minus K. So why is that the case? So you see you have then, once you replaced that term over here by that random variable, you can take the sum inside the expectation and then you see you add all the terms which are uh, for ZT which is strictly less than minus K. And uh, then you end up by the following simple expression, namely you have that prefactor and then you have the expected value under Q, so you can, you can rewrite that term, this, this factor over here in terms of S1 capital T, then you end up with that additional factor barrier divided by S1 naught squared, and you end up here with the term that S1T is less than S1 naught squared divided by B. So what do I do here? So I erase both sides, uh, so write both sides in the exponent, meaning I multiply both sides with the logarithm of 1 plus u, then I use uh, the, log the rules for computing the logarithm, which allows me to take this factor as an exponent. Then I apply the exponential function of both sides, which is strictly monotone, which does not change that inequality sign, and then I multiply both sides with the initial value S1 not in order to get, to get from ZT to S1T. So and by plugging in that expression in that difference over here, we end up with the following expression, namely the arbitrage free price of, of the 
up and in call option is nothing else but this factor 1 plus r to the minus t of the expected value under q of s1 t minus k positive part times the indicator function that the price process at maturity exceeds the barrier b plus uh, 1 plus r to the power minus t times this uh, factor q divided by 1 minus q to the k times the expected value under q of the following difference the price process at maturity multiplied by the barrier divided by the initial value of the price process squared minus the strike price times the indicator and from that you take the positive part and then times the indicator function that the um, price of the risky security at maturity is below the value s1 not squared divided by the barrier. So and the nice thing is, as in example 3.1, these resulting European contingent claims only depend on the price process at maturity. So we can write down an explicit formula as we did in example 3.1. So here it is. So we have that the price, the arbitrary price of that um, uh, up and in call option is nothing else but 1 plus r to the minus t, the sum t from 0 up to capital T of this um, binomial coefficient capital T choose t, q to the t times 1 minus q to the capital T minus t times exactly the value of the price process to the so s1 naught times 1 plus u to the power 2t minus um, capital T. So that's an encoding of all possible values of our random walker minus the strike price and then I take the positive part and you see on that side over here I get exactly or you can see it from here or from here and you see that the random walker at time capital T is less than minus k, which is nothing else that uh, the process uh, 2t minus k is larger or equal to um, k. And in the other situation, you get uh, simply that prefactor 1 plus r to the minus k, this coefficient q divided by 1 minus q to the k, and then you get here the sum of this um, binomial coefficient t choose k, q to the t times 1 minus q to the capital T minus t, and then here you get uh, the price process including this additional factor coming from this barrier, so meaning from that term over here, which gives you another factor, 1 plus u to the 2k. And then here you get the indicator function that 2t is less than or equal to capital T t minus k. And now you can plug that into the, your computer and you can evaluate that complicated sum. So maybe if t is larger than 2, you don't want to do that by hand. And you have an explicit price for that uh, European um, uh, barrier option. And here's another example. So here's the price of the up and out call option. So again, I consider that particular chosen cox ross rubinstein model, where we impose this condition on P and on U and D. And this up and out call option is given in the following way. So this time I have here again this part from the European call option, but now I multiply it with the indicator function that the maximum of the price process should not exceed the barrier. So that's completely the opposite from what we considered before. There we had have to exceed the barrier, now we should be below that barrier. And you see, you can immediately also compute the arbitrage free price of that call option by the following consideration. So the arbitrage free price of that up and out call option is equal to the discounted price of that up and out call option due to the fact that the value s not not is equal to 1. And now you can rewrite 
Um, so that um, arbitrage free price again by means of that CRM uh, 2.19 as we did here in terms of the expected value under this equivalent martingale measure. And you can take out that deterministic factor, which is nothing else but 1 plus r to the minus t. And now you see I can rewrite that in terms of a European Union call option and an up and in um, a call option. And for that up and in call option, we just have computed the arbitrage free um, price. And for the call option, we also computed the arbitrage free price in example 3.2. And by plugging in these two formulas, which are a little bit lengthy, uh, you also have an explicit expression for that kind of barrier option.